Uh, welcome back. Please welcome to Money Talks. It's a long time coming. Mark Yusko. Mark is the founder, CIO, and managing director of Morgan Creek Capital Management. He's an investor, hedge fund manager who got his start managing endowments uh, for Notre Dame and, and University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill before starting Morgan Creek. Mark, welcome. Thanks for coming on. Great to have you. Uh, Bill, thanks for having me. Really excited to, to finally make this happen. It, ha it has been too long and uh, excited to be with you here this afternoon. So, so I want to I want to get into the kind of sobering part of what's going on for a second. But I think I think it really uh, is important to kind of set some context for your background and what you've done. You're you're the only person I know who's run a big endowment or multiple endowments who now runs and manages a large crypto fund. How did you make this transition, and and why do you think you got it so early? Well, I, I appreciate that, Bill, and 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 I wish I had gotten it earlier in the sense that. Uh, I would say I was I was presented on a silver platter uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem uh, the same month as the Winklevoss twins. They're multi billionaires, and I'm not partly because they they saw it faster. And I was coming out of that institutional world, and I I didn't really get. It. I mean, I, I have a good friend you you know uh, Dan Moorhead, and Dan called me to come out to San Francisco. We had dinner. He said, hey, I'm shutting down my hedge fund I'm going to spend the rest of my career focused on Bitcoin and, and blockchain. And uh, hold on one sec. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is what happens when we're all on the road 24-7. No, I, I apologize. I'm actually okay. in Buffalo, New York for a wedding. Yeah. And we came, we got here late last night, one o'clock in the morning, flight delayed. And we walk into our hotel room I, and there's water all over the floor. There's oh some my God. leak. So maintenance oh coming to fix it. And I said, you can't come until one o'clock. And they're like, here now. Anyway. I thought it was the so, wedding party. We got to have the wedding party on, on Money Talks. Yeah, we'll put the wedding party on, on video. That's why I went with the uh, virtual background so you wouldn't have to see the lovely hotel room. But yeah. but the thing was, I he said to me, I'm going to spend the rest of my career in Bitcoin and blockchain infrastructure. And look, I was not running drugs on Silk Road. I was not a cryptography student. In 2013, I was just like, I, I've heard of it, but I don't, I don't get it. But as soon as he said infrastructure, my eyes lit up and I went back to 1996. We invested mm -hmm. in Yahoo and Google and eBay. I mean, we put half a million dollars of Notre Dame's money into Google, took out 200 million. Like infrastructure of technological innovation, mm -hmm. I get. Mm -hmm. So I wrote about it to clients. Okay. Uh, first part of 2014, saying, hey, this is an interesting special situation. Price was 500 bucks. And I got hate, Bill. Like, we'll fire you. You're an idiot. Don't talk about this. Go do your job. You know, find us private equity, find us hedge funds. And, and that was a little disconcerting. And look, the price then, we were in a bear market, went to 186 bucks from March of 14 to mm -hmm. September. I'm like, oh, they were right. See? No. Eight weeks later, it was a thousand. Yeah, and I no, they're not right. So to make a, a long, long story short, when my son graduated in 2015, I sent him. He wanted to live in San Francisco his whole life. I sent him out, talked to Coinbase, and uh, it's like I don't know, Dad. Maybe it's gonna be a big deal, but I'm just gonna go to KPMG. It's safe. Like you're gonna hate it, which he did. Um, but when Coinbase went public, he's like, "All right, fine, Dad, you're right, but you're not as smart as you think you are." Like, oh, do tell. I told you to go work at Coinbase. And he says, yeah, but you didn't lever up and put your all in Bitcoin. Like, you little, yeah, that's true. So that's a long way of saying I was exposed early. Took me a while to get it. But in, in 2016, I was all in. I mean, yeah. I, was, I went from spending no time on it to about 60% of my time. Today, I spend all my time. I run a venture capital fund focused on investing in the crypto ecosystem and uh, pretty exciting times. Okay, so you've brought up a few things in in, in your sto brief story there uh, that I think are very relevant today. So, so given that there's a really good chance, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this, that we're either in or close to a recession. Uh, one, in, what's your feeling in. on that? And two, no, we're, we're in. Yeah, we're in. Okay, then that part of the conversation is easy. So you and I both lived through the dot com era. And I remember talking to kids who had never lived through a recession before then, uh, who thought that stocks just always went up and to the right. 
Always right and, and there's a lot of people here, like I said in the, in the opening, uh, under the age of 34, who've probably never been in a recession. Other than you know, they probably graduated college maybe after like after the Lehman crash or you know at the beginning of COVID. You know, nobody really knew what to make of that. It's not a recession in a tr- traditional sense. So, so do you see parallels between what's happening now and and 99, 2000, 2001, or does this feel, look, smell different to you? Uh, look, Bill, this is exactly a parallel to 2001. I mean, almost play by play. So you think about from 1995 to 2000, there were 10,000 companies formed. Early stage venture, you know, back to There are not 10,000 good management teams. There just yep. aren't. Yep. So 7,000 of those companies went to zero. Yep. Literally went to zero. That's right. 3,000 of them either went public or got acquired. Some of them became really big companies. And that was great. But there weren't 10,000 good management teams. But everybody thought everything was going to go straight up to the moon. Mm-hmm. And in 2000, the market finally, in March 24, 2000, finally, someone said, wait, the, you know, the emperor has no clothes, literally. And it started to go down. But if you remember back, you remember, is the Fed was like, no, 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 we got your back. Remember, you know, we put in, the Fed put in half a trillion back when a trillion was a really big number. Now it's just like, you know, pocket change, half a trillion dollars to ward off Y2K. Remember, the world was going to end on midnight of January 1st, 2000, because the computers didn't think that maybe they would roll over to a new millennium. But anyway, it did. The world didn't end. But they said, oh, we got your back. So the market actually rallied from kind of summertime through September, almost all the way back to even. And then people woke up and said, whoa, wait a second. And Cisco, just like they did the other day, said, well, I know we said we made a bunch of money the last few years, but we really didn't. So they restated all their past earnings. The market started to correct into 2001. And then in 2001, the fraud came out. I mean, like WorldCom, Enron, and the credit markets blew up. And you and, and Nat were talking about credit markets. That's the key, right? Bonds are down big, right? Traditional bonds down 10%, long bonds down 20%, although I think they're a pretty good buy here as defense. But high yield bonds down 13% and collapsing, collapsing hard today. And so when the debt markets finally crack, that's the sign that things get ugly. And people forget 2000. Markets are only down 6%. 2001, down 12%. 2002 was the big year, down 22%. Mm-hmm. And then they, we attacked Iraq and, and you know, uh, got the GDP going up. Because that's how you fix GDP problems. You go to war. And that's always been the case. And so all this war talk now is not surprising because we are, to your point, we are in recession. And arguably, if we don't do something in a hurry, because of this zero COVID lockdown nonsense in China that has disrupted supply chains. I don't know if you've seen the picture of all the ships, you know, stalled yeah, outside crazy. ports in China. I mean, you could walk, you could walk off the coast of China without getting your feet wet. It's insane. Bill, it's 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 one of the most frightening things I've seen in my career. And and so this is a perfect parallel to 2001. And I think you know, we're far from the bottom in the markets, mm-hmm. and the Fed's gonna have to pivot and they're gonna have to stop tightening. Because they can't fix what they didn't create. See, here's this, this, this myth is that the Fed created the inflation by keeping rates low. No, right. no, 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 no. They haven't created inflation. We don't have inflation. We don't have demand pull inflation. There's not excess demand and limited supply. There were some supply chain disruptions, both in the oil and gas markets and used car markets. 75% of the CPI increase is those two things. Oil prices likely aren't going to double. They're actually probably going to go down right. as demand falls off in a recession. And used car prices, as soon as the chip shortage is alleviated, those will go down too. So what this is, is monetary debauchment. Yep. When empires get overly indebted, you have four choices. You can pay the debt back. Problem is, you could tax everybody's wealth. Forget their income. You could tax all Americans every cent of our wealth. You couldn't pay back the deficit. Yep. Right? I mean, the debt, the national debt, couldn't pay it back. So they can't pay it back. You can restructure it, but someone have to take the other side. No one's going to take the other side. You can default on it. Oh, no, 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 no. Because then the politicians get kicked out and they like to stay in power. So then you devalue it. 50%, 5-0 of all the dollars 
in the history of our republic. That's 256 years were created in the last two years. Yep. What we're seeing is monetary devaluation, not inflation. Like housing prices where I live in North Carolina, up 40%. My house didn't grow. It didn't get more efficient. It didn't get better. It actually wore out a little bit. I yeah, put some money into it. Flow. It doesn't give you more cash flow than it used to. It didn't to. give me any more cash flow. <laughs> Nothing got better about it. Yes. But the, the currency we devalue it in went down. And this right. is the thing I, I always love about Bitcoin, right? One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. But we don't talk about it in Bitcoin terms. We talk about it in dollar terms. In dollars, right, since the beginning, 13 years ago, the dollar has depreciated massively. Bitcoin hasn't gotten better or worse. It just is. It just, you know, TikTok, next block. It just is. The dollar has gotten worse and worse. Here's the thing. There's never been a bear market in Bitcoin, in Argentina, in Venezuela, in Turkey, in Russia, because their currencies are even more shit coins than our shit coin, right? The US dollar. And so when everybody says the dollar is so strong, I'm like, no, no, it's not. It's strong against, you know, dictatorships, which we're approaching, but it's not strong against the renminbi. It's actually down against the renminbi the last two years. The DXY goes up because the euro, the yen, have you seen the yen lately? 130, 132. It's gotten crushed. So to say that the dollar is strong because the yen and the euro are super weak, right. it's oxymoronic. That's like saying stage, like a lot of stuff stage you didn't one have. cancer is strong because it's not stage five cancer. I mean, it just doesn't. Yeah, it just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Doesn't so, make sense. so when when you put a shorter term lens on this, though, you know, I get this. I mean, we we all we agree clearly on the structural issues. Do you see this as kind of short, painful V, or do you think we're in for a prolonged, deep, like like uh, nuclear winter here? No, look, I, it's it's it is the question, and. Sure. You know, it, it, it's when you've been around a while, although you don't look like you have, I look like I have, you look like you've been out surfing this morning, um, which I love. And I, I have been up all night trying to figure out the answer to this question. So, yeah, well, no, but, but here's the thing. Um, we are one or two policy errors away from depression. Yeah. And I don't use that term lightly. Everybody says, oh, Mark, you're so, you know, such a downer. I'm like, no, no, I, I'm just a realist, right? Mm -hmm. An optimist thinks the winds will change. The pessimist thinks the winds will never stop. The realist just adjusts the sails. And I'm a realist. And we are two policy decisions away from a depression. In, 19, uh, in the 1930s, the government, okay, the Federal Reserve and the uh, Congress made two policy errors that turned a garden variety recession following the stock market crash oh. into the Great Depression. One was they tried to tighten liquidity. Right. Okay. We just did that. So we have, we've made one of the two. And the second were these idiots called Smoot and Hawley who put up tariffs. Oh, wait, we did that too. So we might have already made the two policy decisions right. that will lead to depression. And the real thing that has me nervous is the long-term 90-year cycle that had been going on for millennia. The 90-year cycle, 1840, there was a depression in the United States, 1930s, depression, 2020s. So it doesn't have to happen. But when you look at the uh, problem with food production, food distribution, all these you know accidental fires and explosions at food processing plants, um, you know, you look at, at the price of wheat, what just happened with the whole Ukraine thing, and you look at, you know, baby formula shortages, we are on the edge of some really ugly stuff. And look at Ross stores today, right? That's low end retail. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's not a value judgment. I mean, it's just lower price. I don't mean low, sure. lower priced retail. Yeah. Down 26%. Target the other day down 25%. Walmart. Here's the thing that most people don't understand about Walmart. Walmart makes 11% of their revenue every year in 12 hours. Okay. Every month at 12.01 midnight to one in the morning, 12 times, they get 11% of their revenue. 
because people go shopping the last day of the month, you know, 10, 11 o'clock, fill up their carts. At 12.01 midnight, their EBT card, their food stamp card replenishes yep. and they buy. And what if they don't have enough for the rest of the month, that's it. That's it, yeah. Those people are living not even paycheck to paycheck. They're living moment to moment. And the fact that gasoline is doubled, maybe even tripled in some places, depending on where you are. Yep. Food prices are going up. This is really bad. And when you throw on top of it, this China nonsense, which I will argue is intentional. I believe it's absolutely intentional to cause this type of pain because what pain does is it causes people to look around and look for heroes. Mm -hmm. And what did Russia do when we put sanctions on them? They turned to China. Now they have this big long-term oil and gas, which is priced not in dollars, which has been the U.S. hegemony for, you know, since uh, the 1940s, they're pricing in renminbi and ruble. And the more times people look and say, oh, China's our hero. Look what they did in Greece. They went in and bought up all the ports and all this, you know, uh, major shipping route uh, stuff. Look what they've done all over Africa, where they lent them money and they couldn't pay it back. They're like, well, we'll just take that port or we'll take that, you know, rare earth mineral or we'll take that oil and gas reserve. So they are very strategic. They think very long term. And I will argue that their plan is to be the superpower by 2050. Not tomorrow, not next year, but by 2050. And so if we continue to make bad decisions at the policy level, like taking liquidity out of a faltering economy, we're going to shoot ourselves in the, in the head. So, so it, it appears that inflation is going to come down or is, is peaked because the bond markets and oil markets did what the Fed wouldn't do earlier. Okay. That's what, and, and it probably would happen anyway, based on what you're saying. And, and so if the Fed basically says in the next meeting, okay, we're going to, here's a 25 point hike and we're going to do nothing after that, except wait and see, which is kind of yep. their way of saying, okay, you know, we're probably in a recession and we don't want to tell you. Yep. Um, do you think, do you think it becomes a V and, and, and we, we recover quickly because the markets realize that, okay, they kind of get it. Or do you think it's like, it's still because of all the, the, the piled on mistakes, another X years of, of, of or X months of pain. See, I, I think, again, that's, that's, the really right question to ask. And I think economically, very little chance of a V, right? Mm -hmm. I think economically, there's so much damage that's been done by the tariffs from a couple of years ago. Stupid. I mean, just terrible idea mm -hmm. from the supply chain deglobalization movement. Just, just dumb, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you go to just-in-time inventory, you can't suddenly decide, you know, I don't want to buy from you anymore. Right. Take, take, Computer chips, right? Silicon wafers turned into chips. There's only four places in the whole world that produce wafers. We don't have any of that production in the United States. It would take 15 years. I don't know how exactly how long to get a really high functioning fab here in the US. So to piss off those people that supply those really critical things in a digital world. So I think very little chance we have a V economic growth. Is it possible? That, that, you know, animal spirits in the market could come back and that so many people get short here in the short term, which is definitely happening. Look, every day the market goes down. And, and you made a really interesting point in the opening that most people don't realize. The biggest up days in markets do not happen in bull markets. Right. Bull markets go up a little bit every day and go down sharply on bad news or perceived bad news. So the biggest down days don't happen in bear markets, they happen in bull markets. And conversely, a bear market is a market that goes down most days, but then sh spikes sharply on good news or perceived good news. Like, oh, you know, things weren't as bad as we thought. They're still bad, but they weren't as bad as we thought. So, the market so clearly, if the Fed does the Powell pivot, which I fully expect, for a short period of time, the market would definitely do a V. We might see a 10, 15% type of move. Crypto might follow. The problem for crypto right now relative to, to markets is everybody says, oh, it's, it's trading like a speculative asset. Yes, because the free float of crypto, particularly Bitcoin, is so small. 
So small, right? 65% of Bitcoins haven't traded in the past 12 wow. months. Right. They haven't moved. And the holders don't care about short-term price. Other they than care about they, long-term they value. Preservation. That, you know, the dips are great because they just add to their stash, right? So Yeah. And so the problem is the short-term holders, the people who bought only because the price was rising. And I'm going to back up, you know, 18 months. We, again, huge policy error. So you make the dumb decision to lock down, right? Respiratory virus, oh, we're going to lock everything down and, and stall the world. Dumb. Okay, fine. But you did that. But then you made a, a compounding of the error by giving people free money. Mm -hmm. right? You literally sent people free money. So you lock them in their apartment. You say you can't gamble. You can't go to Vegas. You can't, there's no sports. But here's some money for free. So what did they do? They started gambling in the markets, mm. meme stocks, crypto. Oh, and then what happens? Oh, well, we'll loan you some more money on top of that money so you can lever up and gamble more. And look, there are four types of participants in markets. There's investors. Investors are good, right? You try to buy what's cheap. You hold it for a long time. You sell it when it gets expensive. You, you know, keep investing. That, that's good for market. Traders. No problem with traders. They try to scalp a little on the up, scalp a little on the downs. Professional, fine. Then there's speculators. Speculators buy things because the price is going up. They don't have any knowledge. They don't have any interest. They just, hey, it's going up. We'll buy it. But then there's gamblers. And gamblers are the worst because they're using other people's money, borrowed money or free money. They don't care if they lose it because it doesn't have any meaning to them. They didn't earn the money. And here's the worst thing that can happen. If you make that first gamble and you win, it's like going to Vegas and you hit your first you know, hand in blackjack. You're like, oh, I'm good at this. No, that's luck. If right. you play long enough, you'll give all that money back and more because the house wins. That's how it works. And it doesn't mean you can't win, but you got to stop when you're ahead. Because if you just keep playing, you will lose. And so I think the same thing here is, I think many of the degenerate gamblers have been flushed out. I think that was the first leg down, the super levered. I, I tell this story and I won't name names, but someone close to me called me and said, they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, what are you talking about? He says, well, you know, I went to Bitfinex and said, just stomp. <laughs> so you went and you put a hundred to one leverage on an 80 vol asset and the price went down and you didn't make the margin call and they seized the collateral. No, they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, no, you lost your Bitcoin because you're an idiot, All right? And doing that is not theft. Now, someone said, well, but those firms, they entice people in promises of, of riches, get them to over lever, and they are trying to steal. I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. So maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But, but no one stole the Bitcoin per se. They didn't go in and hack it and steal it. Um, you shouldn't have had the leverage. But we have leverage in stocks. We have leverage in bonds. We have leverage in crypto. Now, a lot of that leverage has come out, yep. but it's still higher than it was in 2008, believe it or not. Wow. It's really? It's crazy. It's crazy. And so when people say, are we done? You know, should we buy the dip? I'm like, no, you should sell the rip. Anytime <laughs> things rip here, sell into it, get more cash, get more liquidity, and be patient mm -hmm. because- it's a long-winded way of saying, I think the economy does an L, ultimately a U, because we will survive, right? We mm -hmm. will thrive in the future. The future is bright. And he says, oh, you're such a, you know, you're so negative. I'm like, well, I'm not negative. Again, I'm just a realist. In the short run, it's going to be really tough. In the long run, it's, I'm the most excited I have ever been in my life. So right? let's you segue that into your strategy, right? So everything you're saying makes sense. People, I'm seeing the comments. People, people get it. How does that translate it to either, you know, well, maybe you, you want to talk about your personal investment strategy? Yeah, no, no. So, so two things. So in, in, in Morgan Creek Capital, so, you know, I don't have a Morgan Creek digital background. I should, but Morgan Creek Capital, you know, we do hedged with a capital D funds, right? We do hedge mm -hmm. funds. And I like being hedged with a D, like, so I can buffer the downside. And, you know, our, our funds down six or 7% this year, but that's better than being down 26%. Wow. Yeah, for sure. Right? So, you know, Roy Newberger, founder of Newberger and Berman, one of my heroes, went in the office every day to his 94, managed his own money to his 101. 
finally passed 107. That's a good life. Wow. Said three rules to managing money. Rule number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't lose money. Rule number three, don't forget the first two rules. So on the capital side, we do hedged equity. We do venture capital, traditional venture capital, early stage startups. And in bear markets and economic recessions, the best companies are started mm-hmm. because people get laid off. They need to do something. They say, huh, I'm going to go start a company because I got a good idea. I'll give you a great example. So back in 2001, um, there was this guy got laid off. And long story short, he had this project at Bell Labs called Dense Wave Multiplexing. Okay. Dense wave multiplex. No, no, actually it wasn't. It was the 93 recession, 93 recession. And he got laid off. He said, can I take the project with me? They're like, we don't know what dense wave multiplexing is. Knock yourself out. No one would back him. No venture capital was back him. He got his retired third grade teacher from Philadelphia to give him 300 K, which turned into 300 million because that became uh, Sienna, which is you shine light through a prism and break it into multiple colors. And each color takes the same amount of data through a fiber optic cable. Absolute genius, okay? In 2001, we invested in this little startup called JetBlue Airlines. We said, you can't do a startup airline, that'll fail. It did really, really well in the depths of recession. So Mm -hmm. early stage venture, awesome right now. Hedge funds, really like it. And the last thing we do is China growth equity. No one wants to talk about that, so let's not talk about that. On the other side, Morgan Creek Digital, which I started back in 2018, we run venture capital funds. 70% of the money goes into equity in businesses around the digital asset ecosystem. Today, we do anything in exchanges, Web3, gaming, play to earn, um, tools, software, anything that helps the ecosystem grow. And again, never before, and you and I have seen this, in 2000, the smartest people we knew were coming out of every industry into the internet. And everybody said they were idiots and everybody said they were stupid and they created some of the greatest companies of all time. Now, the migration of talent. I spent yesterday up in DC with a room full of people who have left other worlds to come into this world. Unbelievable. Couple CIA people, you probably knew them. And I mean, just really amazing people coming into this space. It's like nothing I've ever seen. So I'm more excited about the future and what you can build in venture capital. Now, were valuations too high six months ago? Absolutely. Did we and others pay too much for some things? Sure. But going forward, we're going to pay the right valuations for the right types of companies. 30% of what we do is in tokens. Now, in our first fund in 18, we bought a lot of Bitcoin and Ethereum and Solana, and that did great. In our second fund, kind of made a mistake. We went only Bitcoin, missed some of the DeFi stuff, which we should have done. In this fund, we haven't done very much. We kind of said, look, this looks like a falling knife. Mm-hmm. My thing about falling knives, Bill, Every time I've tried to catch one, I cut off a finger. I like my fingers. So I just let the knife hit the ground, bounce around a little bit. If I miss the bottom, I don't really care because I can grab the handle and not hurt myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to let it kind of roll up the other side a little bit first. So I said, what we do is we raise funds. We're on our third fund now. Uh, We are about to launch an opportunity fund, which will be more liquid because I think the decimation in the liquid market is going to get worse, like mm-hmm. like seriously worse. And then they're going to be some buys of a generation. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. So I, I, I know this is pure speculation. Do you think the knife is is already bouncing around or do you think it's still falling? Or I think it's fallen. I, I think if I had to guess um, in, the, in the traditional markets and equities and, and credit, I think credit markets are halfway down. I think credit markets are going to going to fall like hard, like like bankruptcies and defaults and and bad. Not everybody, but but the ones that shouldn't have gotten funding before, they're going to crash. I think equity markets, the the worst, have already fallen a lot, right? Peloton, Zoom. I mean, Zoom is a great company. It's a great company. We're using it right now. It's a great company, but the stock was way too high at 100 times revenues. 100 yeah. times earnings is stupid. 100 times revenues revenue is insane. Is insane. Yeah. And so, you know, Peloton might not survive. Maybe it has to go private, probably should go private. Pinterest probably has to go private. Carvana, definitely going to go bankrupt. I mean, they actually signed a financing deal three weeks ago with bankruptcy clauses in it. 
mm. that Apollo gets to own the company. I'm like, why would anybody own that stock now when Leon, who is pretty good at buying stuff on the cheap, got all this great stuff? So I think over levered companies that don't make money. Oh, here's the thing that you remember this article in the Wall Street Journal, the return of this concept called profits, right? I mean, in 2002, it's like, oh, maybe we should try to make money. You can't yeah. just get eyeballs and TAM and all that stuff. So I think the bad stuff has fallen, but here's the problem. The difference between down 90 and down 95 is you've lost half your money. So don't think just because it's down 90, it can't go down more, it can't. The stuff that still has a long way to go is the big stuff. You, know, you saw what happened to Cisco. Uh, you saw what happened to Netflix. You saw what happened to Facebook. I think there's a lot more. I saw what happened to Amazon. I think there's a lot more of that because those valuations are still too high. Apple, Apple sells at 23 times earnings for a company whose earnings aren't growing. But Mark, the earnings per share are rising. Well, no, they are, but only because they're buying back stock. Buying back so they're doing financial the engineering. Team. Their net yeah. earnings is the same as five years ago. Right. That's not growth. So why would you pay a growth stock multiple for a company that's not growing? It's a great company. I love my iPhone. It's awesome. But I wouldn't buy that stock at 23 times, um, nor would I have bought it 35 times or 40 times. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I think, the public markets have got a ways to go down, and I think the liquidations will accelerate. And that's when you see these fast drops. That's people getting margin calls. And that's what's going to hurt crypto. Because in a margin call, you don't get to sell what you want to sell. You sell what you have to sell. Yep. And that's why gold bonds, crypto back in 2020 went down so much. People like, why are those going down? They're not getting impacted. Well, no. People need But if cash. you own a liquid asset and you get a margin call and your stock went down 50%, well, you can't sell that to cover the margin call. So you got to sell something that didn't go down. And I think that's where we are. And I do think, unfortunately, still, particularly in, in some of the alternative tokens, uh, they're just over levered, right? People didn't learn the lesson that, the problem is you can't learn it from other people, right? You have to feel the pain in your gut of the loss. And leverage can never yep. make a bad investment good. Yep. Can never turn a company around and make it have cash flow. can never make a bad investment good. But it can, and unfortunately sometimes does, make a good investment bad because it forces you to sell when the price is below the value. And this is, you know, I stole this from John Burbank and you know John from San Francisco and you know, John has a great line, price is a liar, right? The price of anything, Apple stock, Amazon, Bitcoin, Ethereum, has nothing to do with value. Value is determinant, right? We can look at the size of a network if it's a crypto, we can look at cash flow if it's a business, the value we can determine. But the price is set by two people that decide to exchange a very small amount. Yeah, so yeah. if you and I want to trade 100 shares of Amazon, that price of 2,100 bucks or whatever it is today, that's the price. But yeah. if I had a million shares, that is not the price because you're not going to pay that same price for a million shares. You might pay for 100 shares. So same is true of, of overvaluation and undervaluation. Humans do two things really well. We buy what we wish we would have bought and we're spectacular at it, right? We constantly chase the hot dot and buy things after they've already gone up. And then we sell what we're about to need. Like investing is the only business I'm aware of when things go on sale, everyone runs out of the store. Like we put <laughs> wedding dresses on sale. People don't run out of the store. They run right. into the store, sure. right? Sure. When you put stocks or crypto on sale, people run out of the store and the cheaper the price, the further they run. And so the challenge is that we have to remember that greed pushes prices way above fair value. Let's go back to 2018. So 2018, November, the value based on the Metcalf's law, uh, supply demand model, said that value of the network was about 10,000. We got to 10,000 within like five days of what the model said. And then we went right to 20,000. And it's like, oh, we're going to the moon. We're going to 100,000. I'm like, no, no, we're not. We're going down. And they introduced futures December 18th, 2018. And from there, we went down you know, 84%. Why? Well, one, when you create futures, it's bad for things. Because then you can create paper assets instead of physical assets. Paper assets can be shorted 
by banks. Look at gold. Gold has been flat for years because JP Morgan spoofs the price. They pay a billion dollar fine. Everybody looks the other way. I'm like, what? what? They're doing illegal stuff. And like, well, but we made 20 billion. We pay 1 billion just to cost of doing business. So that's what's happening in Bitcoin right now. It's being pushed down by people shorting the futures. That's why they didn't approve the spot ETF. Um, And so fear and greed drive those movements above. We had greed in 2018. We had greed last November. Fair value today. Let's take the Bitcoin network. Fair value, 32, 33 somewhere around there. So now we're below fair value. The problem is we can go way below fair value. I'm not saying we will, but you can, because that's when fear sets in. Now, the reason I'm not as concerned of a giant fall, actually, I retweeted a great uh, tweet thread on this from um, Jogi, uh, J-O-G, I can't remember his name. Anyway, so at Jogi something. And it's this great thing. And basically, Bitcoin is cheap relative to its history. Stocks, NASDAQ and S&P are still expensive relative to their history. Mm -hmm. The S&P would still have to go down another 30 plus percent to get to fair value. We're arguably below fair value in Bitcoin. Now that doesn't mean we can't go lower, but I, I think stocks have much further to fall because I think they need to get to fair value and go below fair value. Whereas, you know, truth be told, I'm still a little nibbler here I, I don't believe in buying any asset all at once. I think you should buy some. And then if it goes on sale, buy a little more. If it goes on sale, buy a little more. If it goes on sale, buy a little more. And just keep accumulating. And for me, particularly with Bitcoin, and I'll make some people happy and some people angry, I, I believe in the base. Bitcoin, Avalanche, Solana, Ethereum. Now, why do I believe in that? Well, I believe in the, in the stack. So in the, in the internet, we have TCP, IP, FTP, HTTP, SMTP, www. In the new stack, I think it's Bitcoin, Filecoin maybe for FTP. I think Ethereum is kind of like www. And then there's a bunch of things fighting to be a HTTP and SMTP. And is that Solana? Is it Cosmos? Is it Polkadot? Is it Avalanche? Is it something else that hasn't been created yet? Is it Polygon? I don't really know yet. And I'm not super techie. Um, I have other partners that do that. I'm the financial services guy. Uh, but I do think that owning that base layer is really important. And to me, Bitcoin will be one of, if not the base layer. Yeah. Okay. So I, I tend to agree with you on that. So just to kind of wrap this up, I mean, this is, this has been a masterclass and, and, um, the comments here are very appreciative by the way. So, so, you know, your comments about the knives, your comments about, about crypto, it all makes sense. Bitcoin has never traded, to my knowledge, three standard deviations below its below its average price. And it's actually approaching that now, Yep. if I'm reading the charts right. And that yep. means that in order for Bitcoin to even stay above three standard deviations, it would probably have to be trading at like 80 to 90,000 by the end of next year. Yep which would still mean it's two to three standard deviations below yep. its, its kind of it's long-term trend, which yeah. is, which is incredible. Right. Um, yep, yep. And that's obviously not true for, 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 for you know, any of the indexes. And stuff oh, no. not even right. close. So, so um, you know, that's very encouraging to me, but um, like you said, that doesn't mean it can't go down. It just means that long-term uh, you know, it should, it, it should basically. Well, but again, you and I have lived through this and no matter how far Cisco fell or Microsoft or Intel, you knew that those companies that built Web1 were going to do well, right? You knew they were going to recover. You knew the web wasn't going away. And you knew that the companies that built on top of those for Web2 would be an even better opportunity. And again, this is why I get so excited, is if you think about a a parabolic curve and parabolic growth or exponential growth is the thing that the average person just doesn't understand. If I say, what's two times two, everyone listening will say four. Okay. Got it. Uh, if I say what's 21 times 17, I'll wait. That's the limit of human intelligence. The average person can't do that without a calculator. Mm -hmm. And so if I say, how are you at nonlinear regression? Ooh, not very good. So how about exponential growth, right? If I take 20 linear steps, 
I get to the other side of my hotel room. If I take 20 exponential steps, you'll be on the moon. I get to high five you twice because I go around the world twice. Right. 20 linear steps. If I take 30 linear, st- I mean, exponential steps, the exponential steps, if I take 30 exponential folds of a paper, right? I'm at the known, I'm at the atmosphere. 50 is the sun, 100 is the known universe. Exponential <laughs> growth is what it's all about. Yeah. And so you think about an exponential curve. Web one, okay, which was amazing. Intel, Microsoft, the area under the curve, parallel to the X axis, was big. Multi hundred billion dollar, even trillion dollar companies. Web two, near the curve, okay, Alibaba, Netflix, Apple, okay, more wealth, first truly trillion dollar companies. Now we're about to go parabolic, okay, that's web three. The wealth creation opportunity for web three is the biggest we'll ever see in our lifetimes, even if we're here a long time. Yep. And it's because we're building on better technology. You remember this, right? Web one was building on dog meat, yep. client server technology, dial up modems. I mean, it was horrible. Netflix almost went bankrupt twice because you had to wait four days to download a feature film. No one's going to wait four days. No one's going to wait four hours or four minutes. They want yep. instant. So, but we needed broadband. We needed GPS tracking. My, pets.com, the epitome of the zero in the internet age is Chewy.com, $20 billion company. Same company. Excellent. They just needed the infrastructure yep. to get in place. And so we're at that same inflection point where we're not building on dog meat. We're building on the internet. We're building on the mobile net. And now the trust net which is where everything of value, every stock, every bond, every currency, every commodity, every piece of real estate, every private business, every everything will be digitized, will trade over blockchains. And all a blockchain is, once you see this, you can't unsee it. All a blockchain is, is a ledger, digitally encrypted, and every line is a token. And all that line is, is a title, a title to a stock, a bond, a currency, a commodity, a piece of business, whatever, a piece of art, a JPEG, doesn't matter. But everything will be these tokens, these entries. And that's why I don't like the term NFT, non-fungible token. That is what it is. But people think that's a JPEG. No, right. non-fungible token. Right. Yeah. Everything, your marriage license, your driver's license, your title to your house, yeah. everything will be a token. I like digital property rights mm-hmm. as a better term, yep, agreed. but ultimately the businesses that get built now and why you started this call saying how excited you were to come back from permissionless and all these web three people who are leaving their real jobs. And I went to a Blockworks event right before COVID. And I'll leave you with this uh, back in at the end of 2019, literally right before the lockdown. And I gave my usual talk about how excited I was and how this, you know, this migration of talent. And this, this young guy comes up to me afterwards, hey, w- would you call my mom? I'm like, what? He's like, my mom thinks I'm an idiot. I left this big law firm. I go to work for this crypto company. He's like, yes, let's go call your mom. So he called his mom. <laughs> he said, no, he's actually really smart and he's doing really well. And, uh, and that's where we are today. We have these- And she amazing- didn't say, well, wait a minute, you're both idiots. Uh, well, no, no. I mean, she, she probably <laughs> did say that if she hung up. And <laughs> why are you talking to my son? Um, but, but look, we are at an amazing inflection point. We have to cross the chasm, right? The chasm of profligate spending, bad policy. Uh, I will argue the dictator playbook, which you know the Fed is designed, and right? the Fed is not federal and has no reserves. It isn't owned by the government. It's owned by the banks. It's designed to take our wealth yep. through inflation. Yep. Inflation is not good for you. It's not good for me. It's not good for you. It's not good for anybody. It makes the elites rich. It's why have the greatest wealth and income inequality in the history of mankind. Bitcoin frees us from that. It is a deflationary asset, not an inflationary asset. It allows us to do all the other things on all the other chains and all the other businesses that will be Web3, that will be the metaverse. And it's all going to happen. And that's the cool part. Yep. So this has been an absolute masterclass. I, I, I love this conversation. I'm looking at the real time chat here. It's been awesome. Uh, besides being just a super interesting guy, fascinating. Uh, you're also the adult in the room and we really appreciate getting your perspective on all of this. Uh, where can people follow you online? So uh, on Twitter, I'm, I'm at Mark Yusko. So M-A-R-K-Y-U-S-K-O. 
Uh, I actually have a LinkedIn, but I actually don't use it because I'm just I just I'm just bad oh, yeah. at media. Oh, good. No, but really, uh, my, my really DMs my DMs are actually open on on Twitter, and I actually do answer them. Um, as long as people are respectful, I, 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 I block early and often. I will say that I have no time for trolls. I have no problem. But, with that. um, and then we're at, you know, we're at Morgan Creek cap, cap.com, uh, website for the f- company. And I've done a lot of podcasts. I do a, a, do a thing every week, except this week we didn't cause, uh, <laughs> Mike got sick at permissionless. Um, so, uh, but, or maybe he was out too late last night. Maybe that was the real thing. Um, I'm just, I'm just busting on you, Mike. Um, so, but there's a lot of places I'm out there, but look, I, I really, uh, I love our relationship and I, I hope we get to do this again sooner yes. than later and, uh, congrats to everything Abra has built. You are a, a stalwart in, in our industry and, uh, really appreciate, uh, spending time with you today. It's awesome. Well, Mark Nisco, uh, uh, Morgan Creek, we really appreciate you and thank you for, for coming on Money Talks. 